psychics have really shown that people really don't like answering that kind of question. First of all, they don't even know what they're really answering. Second, it's like, yes, I do want to move it. I just told you I want to move it, so why are you even asking me? And so they just find it as an annoying. But really, from a security perspective, we don't really have any other choice because it's, if it's not the malware trying to do it, and we don't really know if it's the malware or the user, and, if, and the user needs to really approve it because they need to override the default policy. So the user experience, the application compatibility, and then, like I said, the technology issues. When you look at creating a boundary across, around something like that, you say, well, okay, what are all the ways that data can right now flows through those places where we want the boundary? And it's like, well, there's this case, there's that case, there's SMB, there's uh, a con DCOM, there's a COM thing over here, there's this way to access this file over here, and, and you look at all the enormous number of places that you need to change and get it, get it perfectly right and get the whole system bought in, and then you say, well, ISVs need to buy into it, then it's this monumental thing. And at the end, you say, okay, so what are we going to get for that? We're going to get, the user's going to get a lot of dialog boxes. And are they really going to be any safer? And the, the questions, when, at least in all the cases I've looked at, the cost of doing it, app compat user experience, just does, isn't worth what people want to spend on mm -hmm. security for, for those cases. It's like, People want their dancing pigs to dance, and or they want to <laughs> open the video that their friends sent them, or whatever. And so that makes it just enormously challenged. It's almost an intractable problem to solve the, hey, malware has gotten on your machine. What do you do about it now to try to constrain it? So I think that if you look at the way that antivirus, the anti-malware industry has gone, we've it's been based on signature-based uh, and identification of malware and that doesn't scale and that's been shown not to scale. It's been years now that the anti-malware industry and security researchers have recognized, hey, this, we, this is just not keeping up with the rate of malware, the sophistication of malware that uh, is polymorphic and metamorphic that can change as it, as it uh, propagates. So <clears throat> that, uh, the bottom line is and those, those kinds of solutions, just like the kind of solutions I was just talking about in the OS, are based on, hey, the malware's gotten onto your machine, or it's about to get on your machine. It's, it's there. How do we get it off? How do we clean it? How do we identify it? And I think that both of those really aren't the way that things are going to play out, just because both of those have so many challenges to them. And really, the way we're going to be heading is down towards whitelisting, is, being able to, is identifying what should get on your machine. What software do you trust? trying to constrain the attack surface. Um, defense in depth mechanisms like ASLR in depth to block out when you do have software that you trust on the machine, how do you prevent that from getting exploited in the case it's got some error bug in it that could be potentially result in buffer overflow and arbitrary code execution. So yeah, I saw this coming actually back in the early 2000s and started working on an internals product called Protection Manager back then, which was a whitelisting. Program. How do you how do you identify in a scalable way for an enterprise what software should run and what software shouldn't run, and make it so that you can delegate that down to people closer to the desktops that are running the software know what people should be using in their groups, and uh, that was acquired uh, as part of the internals acquisition. That's not being productized now, but the whitelisting concept is going into the, like Sterling, which is forefront client next version of forefront client security that will have a whitelisting feature. There's software restriction policies built into the OS that are, there's more F work being put into those, that. And you see the rest of the industry all now, it's like, oh, you know what? Whitelisting is the future. And you see that a lot in the last few months. So whitelisting and those defense and depth things, I think that's ultimately the, where things are going. For consumers, the whitelisting might be, I'm only buying my, store, my apps from a certain store that is providing me some kind of service that says, I, you know, we know what the software is from, uh, we know how to get back to the vendor, we're doing some kind of sanity checks on it to make sure it's not malicious, um, or you're outsourcing it to a service, you know, from some store, uh, some, you know, uh, system management service that is basically saying to you, if you want to be safe, then these, uh, we, I, we know this list of software, we know something about it. And if you've come across something that we don't know about, well, you're putting yourself at risk, and you should think twice about it. 
do you think that, I mean, there's whitelisting, there's blacklisting, and there's kind of that area of behavior-based and, yeah. and dynamic response. Do you think that will play more of a role? So the behavior-based, I've never really been a bit believer in behavior-based um, anti-malware. In fact, uh, when we talk about the uh, Windows itself, I've been uh, vocal about not putting behavioral-based security into the system because I just, that's another thing, another kind of technology that I don't think scales. You can get behavioral-based, uh, any behavioral-based solution works against the malware that the behaviors are trained against or, or that's designed against, where you say, uh, you know what, the common, the, the easiest case is one of these hyper-fast spreading network worms that just blasts itself across the network. Well, behavior-based would say, if we see unusual high numbers of outbound packets coming from any particular system or a kind of spread across our network of these pa packets with these signatures, then we know that there's an attack going on. And that works against malware that behaves that way. But the malware then says, well, you know what? That's All these behavioral blockers are in place that are detecting us that way. Well, what are we going to do? Let's just propagate very slowly. And now we've defeated the behavioral blocker. And the behavioral blocker blocking guys then adapt to that behavior and the any malware people come up with some other variation on behavior and it's the cat and mouse game that's just like the signature based game that you can never win. Uh, so and and the behavioral stuff just gets more and more complex and the big problem with behavioral blocking is the false positive aspect of it. It's the hey this behavior right here this pattern that we see looks like it's malicious and of course that means a administrator has to get involved or there's it starts to block things and if you're blocking legitimate activity that causes people major pain if an administrator gets involved that's major pain for them and major cost and so these solutions aren't perfect and they uh, they're not a hundred percent effective and they're not perfect and the blacklists or the sorry the false positives are really what kills that kind of approach so some people or some people out there you know say that we should just scrap windows or we need to scrap windows there's the whole topic uh, of that, you know, that leakage that, that, that yeah. happened there. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, do, do, we, do we need to go down that path or? Um, well, so the, the leakage you're talking about is referring to the Midori incubation yes. that's going on under Eric Rutter. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, basically taking Singularity, the concepts of Singularity, which is a totally managed .NET type managed garbage collected OS and, and uh, I investigating ways to make the OS really scalable across different nodes and to asynchronous and responsive and, and they've got this uh, asynchronous programming model that they're building on top of that. As far as the future of Windows and Windows being not something based on what Windows is today, uh, I'm working in Windows, I'm not working in Midori, I'm not working in some other incubation so I think that kind of answers the question right there about what I think is going to happen with Windows and that is that the future will be windows of some kind. Um, it just doesn't make sense to me. It, it, what kind of amazes me to people that just say, hey, let's throw everything out and start over because there's so much that's been invested in things that are in windows. If you look at how much work has been put into the kernel, I mean, the, the windows kernels, in my opinion, the, and the numbers back this up, the most scalable kernel, uh, the, the one that supports the most drivers of any kernel, uh, hardware devices of any kernel on the planet if you ignore uh, if you just focus on PC hardware and, and server class hardware and uh, that's just a, a huge investment a huge asset that we've got that I just don't think it makes sense to just toss that um, it, it does a great job and uh, it's not perfect and there's no kernel that's perfect and no OS that's perfect but if you uh, just throw all that, that that's literally probably millions of man years of work has gone into to tuning it and designing it and implementing it. Mm -hmm. And you take a look at all the pieces that are in Windows that way. Sure, that uh, putting them all together in the same way that we have today, that might not be what might not be what we want to do in the future as we go to different, you know, we, we're trying to fit on different devices and devices are getting smaller and, and servers are getting more specialized and we want Windows to work on all these different things that uh, we might need to make this system more composable so we can take pieces and put them together in a way that makes sense and not carry everything around. And 
Minwin is kind of the start down that path, and Minwin is something.